I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, this will be something completely different, um, but hopefully is of interest and in, in kind of look into the future of uh, where we maybe can go trying to take things like 3D printing and uh, advanced manufacturing and combine that with kind of the cutting edge and stem cell science and other areas to push forward new therapies and at least start to think about can we rebuild organs from the ground up uh, to either repair or eventually replace and solve things like the shortage of organ transplants. So my talk is titled Advanced Biofabrication Inspired by Developmental Biology of the Heart. I'll talk a little bit about that, try to also give you just a background of the field and kind of where different technologies are. But ultimately what we're trying to do is understand if we can take something like the embryonic heart shown here. In the human, heart only forms during embryonic development. When you're born, your heart is basically just a tiny version of the adult heart and the cells get larger, but you don't really get new heart muscle cells. So we look at embryonic development, trying to use that as a working system from which we can extract engineering design principles and then rebuild scaffolds that are based on that stage of life. And in order to actually be able to do what I just said, we really need new fabrication technologies that, that can actually put these systems back together in really any way we want. So this is an embryonic heart, only about a millimeter and a half in diameter. This is from the embryonic chick. And we're working on technologies that allow us to do things like uh, Oh, I need to actually plug in the dongle. Hold on. Otherwise, I click and nothing happens. There we go. And, and print scaffolds, and this is a hydrogel scaffold based on that embryonic heart structure. So let's talk about the heart. Let's just give some background motivation. Obviously, we're all familiar with the heart. It's the uh, uh, major organ that pumps blood. It operates for billions of cycles, which is pretty remarkable because your car obviously needs an oil change every 3,000 miles or so. And uh, your heart operates for, you know, for most of us, 80 years. And if you're like Cyril and Amazon shows up with meth, you know, even if you do the meth, you're going to have that heart work for about 40, 45 years, <laughs> which is pretty remarkable, okay? It's chemically powered, electrically synchronized. That's why you have the uh, contraction, contraction um, the locational contractions that you have starts at the apex and propagates up. And it's composed of billions of cells cardiomyocytes that I'll talk a lot about, which are heart muscle cells, but things like neurons and fibroblasts and endothelial cells and, and so on. And the problem with the heart is that it doesn't regenerate, right? And so that's one motivation we have to fix it. Uh, arguably, this may be one of the more complex things to go after in terms of an organ repair, uh, but sometimes you go big or you go home. So when we think about the heart, just to kind of put the disease in context, cardiovascular disease, which also includes stroke, heart disease, and, and peripheral vascular disease, is a leading global cause of death. Doesn't matter if you're first world or third world, it is the leading cause of death. 17.3 uh, million deaths per year in 2016, uh, estimated to be 23.6 million by 2030. Uh, heart disease in the US, uh, and that's actual disease of the heart, 370,000 Americans died in 2016. And the cost of all cardiovascular disease uh, per year is uh, over $300 billion. So anyway, it's, it's a big deal. I think that's the take home point. And there's only one cure for end stage heart failure right now, and that's heart transplantation. Right? Heart transplantation is remarkably successful. Right? If you get a new heart and it's matched and you have immune therapy, immune suppression therapy, uh, that transplanted heart is going to last 10, 15, even 20 years. Right? Someone else's heart in your, in your own body. The biggest issue with this therapy. As I mentioned on the previous slide, there's about 300,000 people a year who die from heart failure. All right, this is a graph of heart transplants performed around the world from 1982 through 2011, and the numbers are about the same. This orange level, okay, this is the US, this is Europe, and this is the rest of the world, uh, including uh, Israel. I think Israel's in the rest of the world. So <laughs> it's a much smaller country. But I think you see, regardless, that we're stuck at about 2,500, right? It's because the supply is limited, all right? There are not going to be more hearts available, all right? And if you guys like Uber, right, there will be fewer hearts available, right? Because what does Uber hopefully stop? Car accidents, right, which is a major source of donor organs, all right? My point is, is that we know for, I mean, it's, it's weird how these things are connected, but it's the truth, right? So, so it's amazing. You, we, we know that if we had a fully functional heart, right, we can put that in a person, right, and they can live 10, 20 years easily, right? It's just we have a lack of supply, right? And that, that's a challenge because the heart's incredibly complex. And, 
you know, this is a similar story for other organs. There's only one organ we have that's actually in surplus, and that's corneas. We actually export corneas in the U.S. to other countries. Now, obviously, there are mechanical solutions, okay? Uh, you can have a, a, basically a, bio, uh, a mechanical heart shown here. Uh, obviously, uh, Jarvik uh, they started uh, developing mechanical artificial hearts since the 50s and 60s, but they're not viable therapies. They're mostly used for bridge to transplant or for patients who are so sick there are no other therapies. They're still very, very expensive. They typically form clots, and you die from blood clots within a few months to maybe a year at most. All right? And that's despite about 50 years of research into these kinds of devices. Now, things like kidney dialysis are much more widely used and successful, but if you ever know anyone who's on dialysis, it is not a pleasant experience, and if that person has a kidney transplant, they are far better off, okay? If you want an artificial lung, that doesn't even exist. So if you need a lung transplant, there, unfortunately, there are no options. What that means is there are millions of people worldwide that need a new heart, lung, or, or, or other organs. So that kind of just kind of, I think, sets the stage for the need for these kinds of technologies and the potential impact they have once they become successful. So for heart repair, we need new human cardiomyocytes. Uh, the heart muscles in the adult don't divide, and there are no stem cells in the adult that form new heart muscle cells. Luckily, we have new ways of doing that using different stem cell technologies. What I'm showing here is something called induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS stem cells. This is basically the way to take a skin cell from any one of us and turn it into something more or less equivalent to an embryonic stem cell. We do that by reprogramming the cell, so you can take a skin cell, reprogram it into a stem cell, and then differentiate that into a heart muscle cell. And so basically with these new IPS cells, and this is uh, what Shunya Yamanaka received the Nobel Prize for in 2012, this was only developed in 20, uh, 2006, so it's a relatively new technology. Uh, you can now generate new cardiomyocytes at scale. Now, obviously, the, the simpler approach, or the, the, the one that makes the most sense to try first, is to either take these stem cells or to take the cardiomyocytes that you generate from these stem cells and just inject those into the heart and hope that those cells can now repopulate that tissue and repair the tissue and form new heart muscle. Yeah, unfortunately, that doesn't work. All right, uh, there's been many, many clinical trials using these stem cells and others. Uh, none of them are able to regenerate substantial new heart muscle in the human. Uh, some show a transient effect that disappears after a few years. So we clearly, we need something more sophisticated than just injecting the cells into the heart with a syringe. Now, rebuilding a heart from scratch or rebuilding an organ is not the only place that kind of these technologies of kind of 3D printing and tissue engineering can have impact. The other area is actually in drug development, right? So what we see here is a graph showing the cost of drug development uh, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s to the 2000s, all right? And this is the research in animal testing, and then this is the human clinical trial, right? And one reason that drug development is so expensive is that a lot of drugs fail after spending this money, right? If you could avoid spending this money, if you knew at this stage that the drug was going to fail, Right, that would decrease the cost of drug development because you'd have less failures. Right? It could also accelerate drug development because you'd have less studies having to go through this long course and you could have more studies then to replace it. And this is actually a pie chart just showing drug withdrawals for safety reasons. So these are drugs that have been on the market and they realize they actually have horrible side effects once they're used widely in the population. And cardiotoxicity, which is uh, heart damage, is basically this large slice here. So it is essentially the leading cause of drugs failing in humans. And this, these are not drugs that are meant to help the heart in any kind of way. They just have off-target effects. This also happens in the liver and other areas. So if we had an engineered human heart muscle in the dish uh, that accurately recreated adult physiology, we could radically reduce drug development costs. So, so here's the two major impacts. So this is uh, meant to show you kind of the, what we're trying to rebuild and some of the complexity behind it. So, you know, everyone can think about the heart beating in their chest, right, or your arm muscles moving back and forth, and this is all powered by molecular motors. The molecular motors are down here at the bottom that are only a few nanometers in size and are generating piconewtons amount of force, so incredibly small amounts of force, right? And so these uh, are actually filaments that kind of slide past each other and one kind of ratchets along the other, and that's how muscle cells contract. They kind of move along each other. And these basically form fibers that run the length of cells. These cells form sheets, and they wrap around the ventricle. And so 
you need to basically coordinate the simultaneous actuation of trillions of these in space and time during every heartbeat, right? That's an insanely complex controls problem, right, that we don't have technology right now to kind of mimic. Luckily, we don't have to, right? Every cell contains the, the DNA that kind of encodes, you know, genetic algorithms that drive the cells to self-assemble these structures. And so what we need to do is understand how to interface with the cells at different length scales that we can provide essentially boundary conditions or instructive cues to help them guide how they form and assemble these networks. So they essentially do all this assembly for us because that's what cells already do. And to build larger scale, we're looking at 3D bioprinting. So one, the, the way cells are able to kind of communicate through materials around themselves is using the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix is things like collagens and also other proteins like laminins and, and fibronectins, but they're essentially biopolymers, mostly proteins, but also polysaccharides or sugars that the cells secrete, assemble around themselves into a complex fiber network. They can form dense sheets that they can sit on to form epithelial layers that might be your skin or lining your blood vessel or more loose connective tissue like cartilage. And basically this is the way that cells can both provide mechanical strength to tissue but also communicate with each other through mechanical and chemical means. I think the best example of this is looking at embryonic development, which is one of the areas, again, that we're trying to draw inspiration from. What I show here, this is a, a zebrafish embryo. This is the yolk sac, and this is the fertilized egg after it's just divided uh, once, so you have two of them. If you remember, right, a fertilized egg, an egg is really quite a large cell. So what you're going to see when I play this video is these cells, right now they're just undergoing binary divisions, getting smaller and smaller until they become the, become the size of a normal cell. And once that happens, they're going to start to migrate around this yolk sac. And the, this is actually a time lapse of the 24 hours in the zebrafish, which is approximately three months in the human. But what the cells are doing is they're obviously dividing, they're crawling, they're migrating, but they're also secreting and assembling the extracellular matrix around them at the same time. If you knock out any of these extracellular matrix proteins, it, it's embryonic lethal. This process stops, okay? So it's the cells and the extracellular matrix together that enables this kind of what we call morphogenesis or the forming of the organs and the animal to happen. And what we see now is that you see this is the, the backbone of the animal. These are so mice that become some of the internal organs. The eyes are always very visible. And then you're going to see it start to twitch, which means the skeletal muscle is formed. So you don't need, uh, so skeletal muscle, once it forms, a really heart muscle as well, uh, it needs to start to contract to actually continue to develop. And that's what's happening here. So I think there's two take-homes here, that it's cells and ECM together that enables morphogenesis. Um, it's also that these cellular systems, things like a growing embryo, are capable of truly remarkable kind of morphogenesis and organ formation very, very rapidly, right, into extremely high levels of complexity. It's just kind of cool to watch also. Um, but that's why we think of extracellular matrix as more than just the material, though. It's, it's a way of essentially uh, encoding and imparting information on the system. And that's because extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix is actually simultaneously combining physical, chemical, and mechanical signaling. It's kind of all intertwined with ECM molecules. And the way information is encoded is things like the 3D architecture of the fiber network, the types of ECM proteins that are there in their amino acid sequence, the mechanical properties and stiffness, the strain state of the molecules, because molecules can be stretched and unfolded, which reveals different biochemical activity if you unfold different domains, and can be remodeled and also sequester and actually uh, enhance the effectiveness of, of growth factors. So let me show you some examples of how the extracellular matrix can guide muscle formation. Uh, this is in a 2D case, and this is actually technology based on the way we make microchips, so using photolithography. And what we're doing is essentially creating a rubber stamp with micro or nanoscale features. We're going to ink that stamp with a protein solution and then stamp it onto another flat surface. So what's shown here is a photo mass that you can shine UV light through on a photosensitive polymer. You create a rubber stamp and ink it with a protein solution, flip it over. Then you define areas of, in this case, fibronectin. Fibronectin is a cell adhesive extracellular matrix protein. The cells are going to come down and stick, and in this case, they'll form aligned muscle tissue shown here. So these are heart muscle cells from a neonatal rat that we can then seed on these stripes uh, and then form aligned muscle tissue. So how, then how do we go from this 2D system to 3D? Because that's ultimately one, what we want to do. And one way to do that is something called a muscle thin film. A muscle thin film is essentially a thin elastic sheet with muscle on one side. And when the muscle contracts, the sheet bends, shown here. And this is under self-stimulation. 
So I think for the Americans, this is like a fruit roll-up, right? A fruit roll-up, right, is basically a treat, right, which is a plastic film with like a fruit-like material on the other side. We just imagine that fruit-like material was cardiomyocytes. When the cardiomyocytes contract, they bend, and when they relax, the, the, the film, the elastic film, they go back to the original position. And if you're from Israel, I've been told that that doesn't make any sense, so that's all right. Um, <laughs> ah, so you know, excellent. Um, so we've shown that you can actually take this and actually start to build interesting things just from this simple structure where you have the elastic film. And this is kind of like origami. You can have a 2D system that can now adopt 3D conformation. Uh, this is a rolled strip. This is a, a gripper where we're changing stimulation rates from either open to closed by how fast we stimulate the muscle. This is actually a film that's walking along the bottom of a Petri dish. Uh, this is one where we're looking at it sideways like a diving board. Uh, with a muscle on the, on the bottom surface, and we can use this to actually back calculate the forces they're generating because we know the, the, the thickness and elastic modulus of the beam they're bending. And then the coolest thing is the tissue engineered jellyfish. So this is a real jellyfish that's about a centimeter in diameter. Um, and this is one where we've matched the body shape of the, by cutting out the elastic film, but we've also patterned the muscle architecture to match that of the jellyfish. And it's almost like an organism level synthetic biology, right? And what this is, is it, it can swim just like the real jellyfish, but it can't reproduce and it can't eat. So it doesn't do all the features, and so it's not going to take over the world, all right, which is what, occasionally I get that. But, um, but anyway, I think what it shows is the potential to use the pattern extracellular matrix to help guide the way muscle tissue forms. You're encoding information in this matrix architecture, and you get pretty, pretty cool functionality back out. The other thing that I want to share with you is then another way to potentially get to 3D is to now to pattern this matrix in 3D. And we know this works from something called decellularized organs. So decellularized organs is where you take something like the heart uh, and you basically use a detergent to remove just the cells. So that's where the decellularized comes from. And this leaves behind collagen and other ECM proteins in a complex 3D fiber scaffold. People have shown that you could put cells back and those cells will start to reorganize based on that scaffold. I think one of the coolest examples is this one with the lung, where they took a lung, they decellularized it, and they put it into a bioreactor that provided kind of pulsatile mechanical flow for both the airway and the blood side. They did that for a couple of weeks. They put that back into the rat, and they got the rat to breathe for about four hours, which is, I think is pretty amazing. It's proof of concept that you can generate a bioengineered functional lung, even if it's only short term. This is an example of the liver. Uh, and then this is a pretty interesting example. This is a composite tissue. This is a rodent limb that they've decellularized. They haven't recellularized it yet, but they can decellularize it. So let me tell you that if you're a mouse or a rat, this is pretty exciting stuff, all right? I mean, you could potentially live longer than your, than your two years you currently have. Um, it's also exciting for us uh, as humans because of the proof of concept of what we can potentially do. Uh, but there are some challenges. So when we decellularize, we use a detergent that turns a cell in, essentially into molecules that are a few nanometers in, di in diameter. It's easy to get those molecules out. But a cell is 10 to 20 microns in diameter. That's like four orders of magnitude larger at least. So getting all the cells back is problematic. It's hard to do that in a rat scale organ. It's really hard to do that in a human scale organ. Um, the second thing is that, you know, you have to use an existing organ to do this, and there's not necessarily a large supply of existing organs to recellularize of high quality. And it also limits our engineering design space to existing organs. We can't build other architectures or other kinds of scaffolds, you know, even if we wanted to. And that's really where we've been trying to, and others have been trying to create new technologies. So we know what is possible in 3D with a decellularized scaffold of ECM protein. We know what we can build in 2D, and, and some of that's pretty cool. That's where 3D bioprinting comes in. So this is just a video of 3D printing. I think most people are familiar with what it is, but it's a way to essentially additively manufacture something, right? So you know, normal manufacturing is subtractive, right? It's the way you would carve a statue, right? You have a block of, of stone and you chisel away to get what you want at the end. It's also the way we you know, make things out of wood. Uh, with, with additive manufacturing, you build plastic layer by layer. So this is a three-axis robot with a heated extruder depositing molten plastic out, and then it rapidly cools, and you build layer by layer that way. So it's a great way to make plastic parts. It's also used in metal and ceramics all the time. This is already having a big impact in medicine today. Right now, surgeons will do a CT or an MRI scan of the body, right? If you need a complex surgery, they'll print a plastic model, and they'll actually map out their surgery ahead of time, right? This is great. It increases success rates and decreases surgical time, right? So these are two things that are great. 
Uh, you can also now get 3D printed custom medical devices. So this is a skull plate that is custom matched to a patient's unique anatomy, 3D printed out of a, a polyether ether ketone material. But what about living tissue, things that are soft? This is one of the challenges. So if you Google 3D bioprinter, this is the picture you get. Um, it doesn't exist, but I think it shows kind of the concept. You have, again, a three-axis robot, so you have X, you have Y, you have Z. You have a cartridge for something like a hydrogel, right, uh, different kinds of cells, cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts, and you would have a computer file that would just spit out a prefab organ just for you, all right? So this is kind of the simplified version. It's actually far more complex, uh, but this is kind of the overall scheme of how this would work. You have an imaging step, right? It could be x-ray, it could be CT, it could be MRI. Next thing you needed to do is figure out how you're going to actually like, design that scaffold. So here's some different ways of thinking about doing it. Uh, doing a biomimicry of the way the ear is assembled, doing a self-assembly approach or mini tissues, modular tissues. You have to figure out what kind of materials you're going to use. They all have different advantages and disadvantages, whether they're synthetic polymers, natural polymers, or this extracellular matrix I talked about. What cells are you going to use and how are you going to get them? Do you want to use a differentiated cell type, like a heart muscle cell, or do you want to use a different kind of stem cell that can become multiple cells? How are you going to actually bioprint it? There are a lot of different bioprinting technologies. There's inkjet, really kind of just an evolution of the inkjet printers we have at home. There's microextrusion uh, and laser-assisted type technologies. And then what's the application going to be? Is it going to be an in vitro platform, like drug testing? Is it going to be implanted immediately for repair? Or is it going to be then matured in a bioreactor, a way to kind of make the tissue more functional than used? So there are already some interesting examples of these technologies. Let me just show you where they are right, right now today. So already in humans, people have 3D printed a tracheal, uh, sorry, a bronchial um, uh, splint that can go around the airway and help hold it open. Um, and that's shown here in vivo. This has been done in children that have constrictions in their airway, and they are able to hold this open and get regeneration. Uh, this is not really uh, an engineered tissue by any means. It's really just a plastic device, but it is patient-specific. This is kind of more research level. This is from uh, last year where this is a 3D printed uh, piece of the temporal mandibular joint up here. This would be the, the mandible here. Um, and they've basically added in different amounts of extracellular matrix with a synthetic polymer and got in different amounts of mineralization. And this is an example from uh, Tony Atala, who's at the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And they've been able to basically print these scaffolds and create these muscle-like bundles and actually implant this into a, a mouse model and innervate it and get some kind of uh, nerve muscle uh, interaction. It's not quite contraction. But none of these can really directly print soft living materials, kind of this vision you know, I've had on, on how we want to do the bioprinting. And so let me just try to totally relate kind of the, the challenge here. So I like this Salvador Dali painting. Um, Imagine you had a pocket watch disassembled in front of you, right, with all the gears out on the table, and you had to reassemble those gears into an assembly. Most of us could start to do that, right? We obviously can't put that whole watch back together, but we kind of understand how most of these things start to fit together. But imagine you had to do that same thing, but all the gears were soft, flexible, and floppy. And you, tried to had to, you had to kind of hold those gears in place as you tried to reassemble them. It'd be extremely challenging to do that. You need something to kind of temporarily support them. And that's really the challenge of 3D bioprinting very soft materials. So, you know, you don't want to print something like Jello, right? Ultimately, what you're trying to do is print something complex like the vascular tree of a liver, all right? So there's a number of groups that have kind of been in 3D bioprinting. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip through this. But, you know, just to say we're obviously not the only ones working on this. There's a number of different technologies. Um, if I can just skip through the end of this one video. This is a multi-nozzle system that pr prints a plastic, a rigid plastic scaffold that's kind of porous, and they kind of inject gel into it, around it. And so the way they hold hot, like soft gels in 3D is creating kind of like a, a scaffolding made out of rigid plastic. And here they printed an ear-like structure. Um, this is an, another group that prints a plastic lattice, um, uh, shown here. Let's see if I jump ahead. Hope I don't just crash the computer. There we go. So we're printing a plastic glass in 3D. These are uh, sacrificial channels. So this will be uh, kind of covered with a gel. And all these little filaments you see will actually be washed away. And they'll end up being channels within a larger 3D gel. This is kind of the, one of the coolest yet most disturbing examples. So this is, one of the, this is Japanese. This is one of the most complex robotic systems I've, I've seen in a while. 
This is picking up little cell spheroids from a dish, moving them over to a, an array of stainless steel pins and sliding these little spheres of cells onto stainless steel pins. They call this Kenzin, which I think means skewer. Um, but they're basically trying to create a tube like this. Every one of those green spheres is, a, is a basically a cell spheroid, a few hundred microns in diameter. And this is the top-down view. They've skewed this onto an array of pins. And here it is from the side. Well, I'll just take a look at that. Right, I think this is just kind of nuts. But, um, but they have these, these pins, and um, here they've slid these little cell spheroids down here. And over time, what they're going to do is they're going to fuse uh, into a, a tube. Um, and then this is another example from Mike McAlpine, who's at Minnesota. And again, this is printing, again, a gel um, uh, into the shape of an ear. Ear seems to be very popular. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but a lot of people print, print ears. Uh, I, I, don't print, I don't print any ears. Um, anyway, um, but I, keep in mind, all these are printing in air, right? And, you know, soft things deform in air. That's pretty obvious, right? Um, because they have very low elastic modulus. So what my lab has done is we actually came up with a new technique we call uh, free-form reversible embedding of suspended hydrogels. We call it fresh for short. So these are fresh prints. All right. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm, um, and so fresh prints, what we do is um, we basically take the syringe of a needle and we print a gel inside of another gel. So we have a temporary support gel and we drop a syringe inside, and we can print a structure inside of that. And our support gel is uh, basically, it's a Bingham plastic, which means it has a yield stress, right? It's basically like uh, hair gel, right? Hair gel has, uh, if you ever seen hair gel at the store, it has air bubbles inside, right? Those air bubbles basically think they're inside a solid. They're not ever going to move. Until you squeeze the bottle, you generate enough shear force, it flows like a liquid. So uh, this is, if you want to see a graph, this is shear force, and this is a... Uh, 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 strain rate, and basically you have to basically get up to a certain, this is a Newtonian fluid here, okay, so you increase shear, you increase strain. Uh, with a Bingham plastic, you have to reach a certain shear force before you get strain. That means the syringe can come down, it moves with enough force to move through easily, and then uh, anything extruded though stays exactly in place. And we use gelatin because gelatin's temperature sensitive, so we can print at room temperature where the gelatin is stable, and cells can survive, and when we're done, we just raise it to body temperature and melts the gelatin away, and even the most delicate structures you can think of survive. So here's the video. Uh, here's the Petri dish. Here's, we're printing a CMU in a, in a gel with a black dye added, and then the rest of that translucent material is the support gel. So I have to show you the CMU. I'm con contractually obligated to do that. Um, <laughs> I'll show you a more interesting thing on the next slide, but basically just appreciate the fact that we can print this layer by layer, create very kind of complex overhangs, and when we're done, we're just raising the temperature of this build platform. What we've shown is we've implemented this on MakerBot systems. You can have multiple extruders. Uh, you can print multiple materials. Um, and then you can also have cells inside your materials. And basically, you can create 3D printed cellular constructs. Uh, you can basically take different kinds of imaging data, such as CT imaging shown here, and print that. So here's a, here's a scaled down version of the human femur to be only a the thigh bone, only a few inches in length. And we're just stretching this under the microscope just to show the mechanical integrity. And we've also done more uh, standard tensile testing with dog bones and things like that. But these are very robust parts made out of purely out of hydrogel. This one happens to be alginate. We've taken uh, uh, basically uh, 3D scans of part of the coronary arterial tree shown here. These are the arteries on the heart. And they become blocked during a heart attack. And we can 3D print these and show that these can be perfusible. All right, this is a, a complex 3D tortuous kind of tubular network. There really isn't a way to have, have kind of fabricated these in the past, at least not out of these soft gel-like materials. Uh, and then this, is, again, is going back to the heart, where we're imaging the embryonic heart during development. We get an optical 3D image. We create a solid model from that, and then we can now fabricate that and then see that with cardiomyocytes. So using this embryonic heart as kind of our design uh, template. And so we can image through the entire embryonic heart. Again, we use the chick shown here. This is a nice kind of confocal zoom through to show you what we can do. Again, this heart is when it's about a millimeter and a half in diameter. And we can then you know, take that heart, create the solid model, and create our print. And here's just a, a comparison of the solid model, the CAD model, that's made transparent so you can see inside. And here's our scaffold that we can now 3D print. This one happens to be made out of alginate. 
All right, and what we're doing now is working to cellularize these scaff scaffolds. We developed the technology that shows these things can be built. We have the printing technology to start to do that. Now let's actually build the tissues, not just the biomaterial scaffolds. And so what we've been doing is taking these different cells. We've been using a bioink, and we've basically been figuring out what's the best combination of cells and specific inks to make functional heart muscle. So just, here's a small human heart muscle strip we make in the lab. It's about a centimeter in length. And now what we're doing is we're 3D printing these, and here's a 3D printed sheet of our heart muscle construct. And finally, what we've been able to do, kind of going back to that decellularized organ, is here's a decellularized heart. Again, this is mostly collagen. And with our 3D printer, this is an actual 3D printed collagen heart scaffold that tries to mimic what we can do with decellularization. And so this is some of our unpublished work we're getting ready to get out the door. Um, we're short on time, so let me just say we've extended this to other areas. We also have some uh, interesting projects in cancer. This is a 3D printed mammary ductal network. Again, trying to get at this idea of how do we study bre human breast cancer better, and so we can now grow human tumor in these more biomimetic environments inside a duct. And this is a little brain model. We're not printing functional brains, uh, so don't ask, um, but because um, <laughs> I'm first in line. But anyway, um, we're using these more for modeling traumatic brain injury where we can recreate the geometry and mechanics of brain tissue and try to understand how forces actually propagate and damage within a complex kind of 3D like brain-like structure. Um, and then uh, let's just talk about then about future work and impact. So basically I've been talking about 3D bioprinting of organs, which is essentially more of a science fiction type topic. So where are we in terms of actually making some of these things a reality? So within five to 10 years, we're gonna have engineered human heart muscle in the dish that's gonna be able to start to replace animal models and drug development. In the more 10 to 15 year time frame, we're gonna be able to combine that and do personalized medicine. This might even happen sooner where we can not just make a human surrogate in the dish, but a human surrogate of your own heart. So you can test uh, toxicity for specific drugs on your own physiology. I think 20 to 30 years is where we're gonna actually get to the point of creating anatomically accurate engineered cardiac patches or whole hearts to repair damaged organs and actually think about bioprinting an organ for transplant. But you know, we're talking many decades off, a lot of things have to happen. And obviously extend this area uh, to other uh, types of, 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 of application because you know, a 3D printer is great because it can make almost anything. We're making a heart with it, right? And some other structures, but you know, just like a printer can make a cup or it can make, you know, um, I don't know, we make Pokemon in my house with it, or dollhouse furniture, right? Obviously, you can do many complex things. I'd just like to thank the people who actually did the work. I recruit very young. Uh, TJ Hinton uh, is the, uh, actually led a lot of the 3D printing development, and that's been advanced along with uh, Andrew Hudson here and uh, Andrew Lee, but I have a very talented group, a lot of great funding. And the other thing I'd like to point out is we've actually open sourced all these technologies. We built our printers on open source tech, so we released the designs back as open source. Uh, so if anyone's interested in playing around with this for this application or something totally off the wall and different, you know, please talk to me. I'm happy to share with you some of our technology. So thank you very much.